Good? Well, good evening. It's 6.30. We're glad you're here. Welcome to Figure It Out here at Calvary Chapel in Santa Barbara. If you're new to the study or if you're looking online for the first time, I'm Dr. Dave Newton. I've been here at Calvary since 1990 and doing this study for about 25 years here at the church. Uh, we're currently in the study called uh, The Prophets Who Prophesied. We're looking at Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And so we finished up <clears throat> four weeks of going through the uh, basics about heaven. And uh, then we started taking a look at uh, the next topic, which is the judgments. But beforehand, I thought I'd show you my uh, brother-in-law lives in Texas, right in line with the eclipse today. So he posted this on uh, his text message to me right outside his home. And then just down the street a little later, uh, did that with a camera. And the other one is just an iPhone shot, but uh, that's how the eclipse looked uh, if you were right underneath it as it was going through. So pretty cool. Um, remember, we'll be moving from God's... Oh, one last, one last quick announcement. Um, so if you were looking at the apologetic series books, you know that all the, fo the forward for each book is written by Todd Von Helms. Dr. Von Helms, a good friend of mine, great colleague, uh, like-minded on so many areas, and... Um, does a great job with those forwards for the book, and uh, all 12 of them, they're slightly different each, each forward for the topic. But uh, his newest book just came out, and uh, uh, I know I'm happy to give it a plug, but uh, if you want to find out about it, it's called Prayerful. And the subtitle is How the Scriptures, History, and Experience Can Shape Our Prayer Life. And uh, Todd's just great because it's just the scriptures, the Bible, just talking all about uh, the basics of prayer, Humility in prayer, the Lord's Prayer, a uh, chapter in here on um, the problem of sin when you're praying. Um, I love chapter 6. It says, God always, always hears our prayers. Uh, it's just that he doesn't always answer the way we'd like. And I've learned that lesson a long, the, a long time. I've been going to men's prayer breakfast here at Calvary since 1990 when we used to be up on Pebble Hill on Turnpike there. And um, so many times... The Lord has to remind us when we're praying, uh, we have an idea about what the answer is going to be and when it will happen. And the Lord is just like, mm, maybe not. And so that's why that model for, uh, let, you know, in the Lord's Prayer that the, the Lord gave to his disciples, it's uh, let your will be done on earth even as it is in heaven. The Lord brings us around to get our hearts in line with him and his will. And I can tell you, I don't have time to give examples, but... I have prayed for different things over the years, thinking, oh, I know exactly how this is supposed to go. So, Lord, can you just do this, this, and that? And, of course, that prayer didn't happen. And then looking back with hindsight a couple years later, you think, gosh, I'm so glad that didn't go the way I was praying because the Lord had something completely different in mind. So, um, isn't hindsight wonderful? Yeah. So, so we're going to move from God's heavenly realm, where we were in uh, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah, we're going to move into this wonderful topic that everybody's so excited to hear about, which is God's judgment. And this is part one. Now, some of the judgments we're going to see are from past history, things that uh, already were uh, done by the Lord with regard to his people. But some of the ones we'll read about during the course of the next couple of weeks are in our still future years from today, and most notably pointing out toward the Great Tribulation in that last seven-year period of time where God is dealing with Israel. And I put this in as a little reminder. The judgment of God is not a popular topic. I understand that. Jeremiah got jailed because of his prophecy about judgment. Nobody wanted to hear it. In fact, he's prophesying at a time that another prophet, who's not a prophet, who's named Hananiah, is prophesying the exact opposite of what Jeremiah is prophesying. So Jeremiah is saying, look, Babylon's coming. They're going to siege the city. We need to just go with it. This is God's plan for his people. We're going into exile. Uh, this is part of the captivity that the Lord is going to do. And this guy Hananiah is prophesying, oh, no, the Lord is with us. Rise up as an army. He'll strengthen us. He'll give us the victory, and we can resist the enemy. And everybody looked at the two and said, yeah, we love Hananiah. We don't like Jeremiah. And Jeremiah ends up getting thrown in prison, and he's actually in jail when the siege of Babylon comes. Think about that. So, um, not a popular topic. Uh, no one even listened or heeded Isaiah's prophecy of judgment. He would prophesy, and they were just like, yeah, 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 whatever, whatever. 
And then with Ezekiel's prophecy, uh, he was openly ridiculed. And so I think it would be interesting to follow this in our topic. So quick little background on this idea of why we see these judgments. Um, at the very beginning, we have Abraham and the promise made to Abraham by God about the land and about a Messiah to come. And uh, then after him is Moses and the Exodus and then the giving of the law. And the first time we then see the tabernacle, and that's the model from heaven put down into a portable tent form that they take with them in the wilderness. Then we find that they are all moaning and complaining. We want to have a king because all the other countries have a king. Why can't we have a king? And uh, the Lord says, you don't need a king. You have the Lord, you know. But they, we want a king. And so, of course, they pick out Saul, who's tall, broad-shouldered, bigger than everybody, handsome. Oh, that's the kind of guy who should have a crown on and be our king. And yet, when it comes down to really anointing who God would have as a king, Samuel ends up going to the house of Jesse. And Jesse brings out his... He has ten sons. He parades nine of them out in front of Samuel, and each time Samuel's like, no, it's not the one. You have one more? He goes, well, I got my 13-year-old. He's out in the field watching the, the, the sheep and the lambs. Let's bring him in. And the Lord says, this is the one, and that's where we get our wonderful, uh, great saying that we hopefully hold on to is that man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And then from there, they have a king named David, and as mighty as he was, and certainly he was recognized as uh, a man after God's own heart, we also see he was very fallible. And um, he has plans to build the first temple, but God says, no, you're, you're basically a, a king, a man of blood, and I don't want you building the temple. So he says, no, I'm going to have uh, your son Solomon is going to be the one who builds the temple. And then after the reign of Solomon and, and the beginning of the splitting of the kingdom. You have the civil war. Israel is then the northern kingdom, or the house of Israel, as it's called. The house of Judah is then considered the southern kingdom. And you have a string of just godless kings, one after another. And uh, they just get into all kinds of idolatry. They just forget about the Lord, and it's really pretty bad. And then you have this great scene where Hilkiah is in the temple, and in some back room kind of behind an old vacuum that doesn't work and a bucket and a mop and some other cleaning supplies. In the back corner, he finds the law and he kind of dusts it off and he brings it out and he gives it to young King Josiah. And they look at it and they go, I know what this is. I've heard about it. It's the law. It's God's law for us. And think about that. Um, I hope you never find yourself in a position where you find your Bible underneath the pool table in the garage or in a, a bucket in the front, you know, front hall closet or something, and you kind of go, what is this? Oh, wow. Oh that's, oh, that's my Bible. I haven't seen that in like 25 years. You know, you wouldn't want to be in that case, but they were. And uh, thankfully, Josiah turns everybody's hearts back toward the Lord. His grandson is going to be a guy by the name of Jehoiachin, and we'll read about him in a little bit and in the coming weeks. But uh, Isaiah prophesies now about judgment. And uh, he's about 740 B.C., about 140 years before the actual siege of Babylon. Jeremiah is prophesying of judgment. He ends up being left in Jerusalem when they come through for the attack. And, and the uh, accounts look like he was taken out of jail and, and hauled off down to Egypt with some of the captives who were taken south. Daniel is a contemporary of him. He's prophesying about the seven Shabu. We did a whole study on the book of Daniel. Can you believe that was like a year and a half ago? And um, there were 70 weeks of years for Israel, God's chosen people, and for his city, Jerusalem. And then Ezekiel's prophesying right about the same time as Daniel and just right around Jeremiah. And he's prophesying, but his judgment, he's going to be prophesying from Babylon. He's already going to be hauled off at around age, age 25. And then about five years later, while he's in Tel Aviv, there uh, along the Kibar Channel, when you say he's in Babylon, he's not in the city of Babylon, he's in the whole kingdom of Babylon. He's probably 100 miles south of the actual city. But that's where he does his prophecy about judgment. And the question is, why the judgment? Why would there have to be judgment? Well, the, the main topic that comes out in the scriptures is that Israel is described as an adulterous wife of Jehovah. Probably not the thing you want to have printed on a t-shirt or something you want to have on a little locket that you wear. You know, oh, what's that say on the back of your necklace? Oh, I'm the, 
the, the adulterous wife of Jehovah, right? Um, Hosea chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, describe how the Lord has just about had it with them. And what he's saying is a faithful wife, in that, in that symbolism, would be staying with her husband who loves her, cares for her. And in that imagery, she's constantly going this way, going out this way, always following other gods, always going after other traditions of the other nations around Israel. And so um, Hosea is actually told, I'd like you to take for yourself a wife. And she's a well-known in the city. She's a harlot named Gomer. And uh, the whole imagery there is that uh, Hosea is going to show her love and kindness, even though she has a terrible reputation. And in that same way, um, that the Lord trying to use uh, Hosea as a way to prophesy to his people about his promises. Uh, they have pagan and heathen idols. And they're trying to, you know, it's, it's bad enough, you'd almost think it's bad to say, well, we just got rid of the Lord and we're just doing our idols. You know what they do? They blend them. They're trying to find ways to bring in statues and chanting and all kinds of worship of the sun and animals and all that. They, they they'd want to merge it in the temple with the worship of the Lord. In fact, there's going to be a statement by the Lord that's going to say, when his, when his, uh, we'll see it in a little while, about a half hour, he's going to, his, his presence is going to depart the temple. And the statement that's made about it is, I've had enough of your sacrifices. I've had enough of your rituals. I've had enough of your, your incense being burned. All the stuff you're doing is just ritual. It's just show. Nothing is going on in your heart. And so you can go through all the motions but it doesn't count for anything. And every time I've read that in the last 40 years, the Lord, the Holy Spirit, just gets right in my ear and says, Dave, are you going through the motions at church on Sunday? Are you going through the motions at men's prayer breakfast on Wednesday mornings? Are you just showing up and punching the clock and showing up at things? Is your heart in it? Even teaching, whether it's a home group or the men's Bible study I used to do or figure it out now for all these couple decades, um, I, I hear the Lord just say, don't go teach that out of routine. Don't go teach it out of duty. Teach it because you're doing it as unto me and, and you have a real passion to teach the word. And, and so the Lord reminds me time and time again because in Judges chapter 2, verse 17, uh, there's actually this statement that Israel plays the harlot with other gods. So while she's got a husband, she's off, in essence, whoring. And she's just very loose and very quick to just jump into anything that's out there. You can read about this also. I didn't put all the passages in, but if you're looking at the notes on your own, 1 Kings 3.2, 1 Kings 14.23, Leviticus 26, Numbers 22. Especially in Numbers, it actually gets into speaking specifically. What they used to do is the pagan uh, Canaanites who lived in the land were really into what are called high places. And it was the idea that you go find a mountaintop somewhere, a little hillside somewhere that's all opened out, and you would go and put an altar there. And they would put it to their goddess Asherim. And what they started to do was create these little high places. And they would spend time in the temple. They would spend time on the Asherim. Um, just really, really an abomination to the Lord. Um, the other reason for the judgment, the 70 years, was the Lord says, you owe me 70 years. He said, what do you mean? He said, well, the law says very clearly you can till the land for six years, but on the seventh year you leave it fallow. Very similar to the, the Sabbath where you work six days and take one off. Similar to how manna was given in the wilderness. They collected it for six days. Nothing came on the seventh. You're just supposed to uh, take it easy on that day. And uh, so they had skipped the Sabbath for the land every seventh year. They did that for 490 years. So divide that by seven. They owed the Lord 70 years. There were 70 years they should have had the land fallow, and they didn't let it lay fallow. And um, Second Chronicles tells us about that, as does Leviticus 25. So from pretty much about the time of David down to Jehoiakim, they are not keeping the Sabbath for the land. And the Lord says, yeah, you owe me 70 of those, one per year in captivity. And when you pay those back, I'll, I'll release you from captivity. But Ezekiel, we saw this several weeks ago when we started the study. I hope you remember that. Uh, he prophesied, you know, he's laying on his left side for 390 days, right side for 
40 days, totaled 430. If you take away the 70 years they were in cap captivity in Babylon, it leaves 360 years of, of judgment that's still to come. And how Leviticus 26 says that if you don't obey me the first time, I will multiply your judgment seven times. And we went through that calculation and showed how it talked about literally the number of days and years right up to them becoming a nation again in, in May of 1948, and then 19 years later, becoming possessing Jerusalem as a city for the first time, um, again, since that prophecy. Jeremiah prophesies about the 70 years of exile. In fact, Daniel, when, you, when we did our Daniel study, we saw Daniel reads the book of Jeremiah. He reads the scroll and recognizes it's going to be 70 years. So he's in Babylon. He's got a scroll of Jeremiah, and he's reading it. And he goes, oh, this is going to be 70 years. He's kind of doing the math. He says, yeah, I, I got picked up when I was around 11 or 12. So if I make it to 81 or 82, I guess I'll see the end of the captivity and get to go back. Interesting. Um, in Jeremiah 32, 6 through 15, we even read about the land deal. I covered this uh, prior uh, when we were in Daniel, that uh, Jeremiah is instructed to buy his cousin Hanamel's land there in Anathoth, which is the, the, family, the family plot, the family uh, place where they grew up. And the idea is after 70 years, it says in the scriptures, houses, fields, and vineyards, there will be deals happening again, buying and selling those, after 70 years. I mean, we're going to be back in the land, and it's going to be good to have title deed to this property. That's why his uh, scribe, who's named Baruch, um, helps him. They do the first version of it, and it's a, they keep it as a deed. And the other one, they put in a clay pot and seal it and store it away for when hopefully the relatives and the ancestors find it in 70 years, that it'll be the record of that land deal. And then God is silent from Malachi all the way to the Baptist, from around 397 B.C. all the way to the, the fall of 29 A.D., there's no prophets. The last prophet is Malachi and does his prophecy, and then it's just this, what many theologians and scholars call the silent years. And um, that's during the time of, uh, you think about what's going on there, the Medes and the Persians come in after Babylon, and then Alexander the Great comes in after them during the 300s. And then, of course, Rome comes in after Greece. And uh, those, those intertestamental period is, is kind of considered silent because there are no prophets until all of a sudden there's this guy in camel hair down by the Jordan River, and he's prophesying, um, I'm the one who is coming uh, to make straight and make, make, make way for the, the, the Lord. And when he finally sees his second cousin, Jesus, he points to him and says, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So John is the last Old Testament prophet prior to Calvary. Uh, Mashiach then comes and fulfills the Passover, just as Daniel chapter 9 talked about. And uh, the 62 sevens and, 77, and the seven sevens equal 69. And that's from the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, which was given by Artaxerxes to Nehemiah. You can read about that in Nehemiah chapter 1. And then the, that time period up until Jesus, we're indebted to Sir Robert Anderson for his book, The Coming Prince, that shows the exact calculation as Jesus coming into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. It's the 6th of April on uh, 32 AD. And... Uh, there's still, though, this one last seven-year period of time, because he said there are 77s for your people and your city. 69 of them are covered in the coming of Messiah. There's one more still outstanding, still future from today. And then the other reason for judgment, Ezekiel chapter 37 walks us through the process of the dry bones coming back together. And that's the restoration of the people in stages coming back into the land little by little. We saw that all during the late 1800s into the 1900s, especially the 1920s and 1930s, and then it culminates with their Declaration of Independence on May 14th of 1948. And um, later on in chapter 16, verses 8 to 21, we do hear that Yahweh is going to restore Israel as his wife. That's pretty cool. He makes a statement that she will once again, you know, come in. I've always loved her. That's never changed. Uh, she's gone off and done other things and served other gods, but she's going to come back and we're going to be back again in our relationship. You can read about that also in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 12 to 15. So you can open your Bibles now to Ezekiel 
and we're going to be in chapter 2. And it pretty much says, he spoke to me, son of man, stand on your feet, I'm going to speak to you. Uh, the spirit entered me, set me up on my feet. He said to me, son of man, I'm sending you to the sons of Israel, these rebellious people who rebel against me. They and their fathers have revolted against me to this very day. I'm sending you to those impudent and obstinate children. <laughs> Anybody have any impudent and obstinate children growing up? Okay, right? Um, and as for you, son of man, don't fear or fear the words I'm giving you. The, the, like thorns and thistles are you, and you're going to sit on scorpions. You're not to fear the words or be dismayed at their presence, even though they're rebellious. He, he knows that when you speak that word to the people of Israel, they're not going to take it well. Have you ever given anybody some quote-unquote constructive criticism? You know, one of the interesting things about being a college professor all those years was every semester at the end of your course, your students do an evaluation. And about 10 or 12 days after the semester ends, the dean gives you a call before you have tenure and says, hey, come up to, your op come to my office. I'd like to go through your evaluations with you. And it's always great to just open up that packet and you wait to hear what these 27 students thought about your class and your assignments and all these things, right? And you have to go through and see how they scored you on a scale of 1 to 5 or whatever. So in this, if you look at verse 10 in Ezekiel chapter 2, go up there. Verse 9 says, I looked and behold, a hand was extended to me, and behold, there was a scroll in it. And he took the scroll and he spread it out before me, verse 10. It was written on the front and the back, and written on it were the prophecies of mourning, lamentations, and woe. So I don't know if you've ever gotten an, a letter from somebody or a message that the main topic was going to be mourning, lamentations, or, or as it says in some, just the, the kind of the sighing, the deep sighing of that, and woe, which was kind of like, you know, uh, warning, if you will. And so Ezekiel kicks us off with that. So chapters 4 through 24 are all about Israel's uh, Jerusalem being judged. And these are prior to the exile. So this is the judgment going on before the exile. Verse, chapters 25 to 32, we saw this at the very beginning of our study the first night when I gave you an overview of the three prophets. But the other nations around Judah are going to be judged. And that's while they're in exile. And then finally, chapters 33 to 48, is going to be God's plan post-judgment for his people right up through to the millennium. And of course, this is happening after the exile. So remember for yourself, if you're thinking about a, a broad overview of the chapter, prior to the exile, during the exile, and then after the exile. And I think it's really interesting to go through this. Uh, the big judgment begins in Ezekiel chapter 3. Why don't you sh scoot over to Ezekiel chapter 3. And as I said, I won't read all these, the entire verse of every passage to you. But as you get up to um, right around verse 16, he says, Now at the end of the seven days, the word of the Lord came to me and said, Son of man, I've appointed you as a watchman for my house of Israel. Now a watchman in those days was uh, they didn't have uh, security cameras and everything all hooked up with uh, Bluetooth and Internet and hot wired and, and, and everything. They, they would put people on the wall and the job was that you slept during the day and you were awake at night so that you could be a watchman. And if you saw something coming and there was going to be a problem, you could sound the alarm to everybody. And he says, when I say to the wicked, you will certainly die. You do not warn him or speak him or warn the wicked from this wicked way that he may live, that the wicked person shall die for wrongdoing, but his blood I will require on your hand. Can you imagine that? You're a watchman. You're responsible to let somebody know that they're off the, off the right path. And if you don't do it, and they end up dying because of it, the blood's on you. Wow. Hope that's more than 11.50 an hour, right? Or something like that. It's a pretty heavy duty on your job assignment. However, if I've warned you, if I've warned the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked days, and he dies for his wrongdoing, you are off the hook. So think about that. He's saying to a prophet, when I want to say something to a huge group of people, I'm going to send you my prophet to be my mouthpiece and speak that prophecy. If you do it in obedience to me and they respond well, great. If you do it in obedience to me and they don't respond, bad for them, but still good for you. You, you obey the word of the Lord and do what you're supposed to do. But if you are supposed to go to them and you don't, 
and then they end up getting judgment on them, it's going to be on you because you did not fulfill that. Does that make sense? Okay. And so he tells them, uh, if you look at that, going up to uh, this passageway, he says, uh, as he's looking at the scroll, um, look at verse 23. I got up, I went to the plain, and behold, the glory of the Lord was standing there, just like the glory I saw by the river Kibar there in Babylon. I fell on my face, and the Spirit entered me and stood me up on my feet. He spoke with me, and he said, go shut yourself up in your house. As for you, son of man, they're going to put ropes around you. They're going to bind you, so you cannot go out among them. Moreover, I'm going to make your tongue stick to the roof of your mouth, so you won't be able to speak, and there won't be a man who reprimands them, since they are a rebellious house. But when I speak to you, I'm going to loosen your mouth so you can talk, but that's the only time. So that's what the Lord God says. The one who hears, let him hear. The one who refuses, let him refuse. They are a rebellious house. So he's essentially saying, I'm going to give you the words. I'm going to tell you when to speak it. And then there's going to be times where you'll want to speak on your own and your, your tongue's going to be stuck on the roof of your mouth and you're not going to be able to talk. Right? Okay? So uh, he's going to tell them that's how it's going to be. And in, in chapter 7, he gets in and says there's this um, process he goes through. Chapters 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. First, uh, imagine you're in the middle of the city. And everybody knows you're a prophet because you've been speaking the word of the Lord. Some, some agree with you, some don't. But you get down in the dirt every day and you start building like little dioramas. It's like you're kind of playing in the mud. You get a little water in there. You kind of build some walls like a sandcastle. It's supposed to be like the city. And then you build a, a, a siege wall with some little sand. You push it up against the side. I've been at the beach before with my kids and now the last several years with my grandkids building some epic, huge sandcastles. And we've got all kinds of, you know, cars driving around and water in the turrets and the moat and everything. And so when you think about it, he's, he's actually putting a siege, siege ramp up. And people are going, you know, what is, what is Ezekiel doing playing in the dirt? And the whole thing is all about the symbolism of this is what's going to happen to the city. Nebuchadnezzar is going to build a siege wall right up here. Then he, sections of the wall, he's supposed to knock them down. And then there's a point of time where he literally comes up against a hard wall. It's the bottom of like a tabletop or a shovel, a shovel edge, and he can't get through it. And it's all symbolic of what's to come. I often think maybe he should have had like those little plastic soldiers. You know, you could have put those down. I had those back in the 60s as a little kid, a whole bucket full of uh, green army men, you know, and you put them all out and get them all set up. Um, and then as he looks out and sees the scroll laid before him, written on the front and the back, the Lord says to him, take the scroll and eat it. And the symbolism there is that you're going to ingest the word of God that's going to be spoken to the people so that you're going to have it in you, and then you'll be able to speak it uh, out to them. Very similar to how John in chapter, chapter 10 of Revelation is told there's that little tiny booklet, and he said, I want you to eat this because this is a prophecy. He puts it in his mouth, and what does he say? When he first tastes it, it's sweet, right? It's like honey. Oh, that's great. And he swallows it. And then it's what? Oh, it's bitter in his stomach, because that's what judgment is. It starts off with maybe it sounds pretty good, but then you realize what the real message is. And um, this reminds us about in Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus is in the wilderness being tempted. Uh, he, uh, he's told, why don't you just eat, you know, make these stones into bread? And Jesus' response to Lucifer is, you know, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. There's that symbolism again of, of living by God's word. That alludes to Deuteronomy 8.3. And I love how Paul puts it to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 3. It's time to get off the milk, and it's time to do what? Start eating some solid food. So when you first become a believer, you might get a little, you know, little booklet, little three or four pages about God loves you or something, a couple little Bible verses in there, and you, you go, man, this is so great. I just found out about Jesus and everything like that. That's good. That gets you in the door. But he's saying that is not how you grow. Because you want to get into the Bible, you want to get into the Word, you want to get on some solid food, some meat of God's Word. And uh, look over, uh, scoot ahead to, um, we're going to get there in just a moment, but uh, over in chapter 8 and verse 14, we're going to see a very interesting thing that's going to happen about this judgment. They've actually brought a giant statue that, according to the accounts, based on how many cubits it was, uh, it was probably somewhere around 17 or 18 feet tall. And it's the uh, pagan uh, Canaanite goddess Tammuz. Uh, the Greeks called her Adonis. And she's going to be set up 
right in the main gate on the north side heading into the temple. And you can imagine, what's, what's the Lord's response? This temple is what? It's a type or a figure of what the temple is in heaven. And he's trying to have it made to very specific specifications that were given to David, passed on through the workmen to his son Solomon who built the temple. And the Lord is having to watch them add pagan idols inside the temple. Not good. And um, the unique thing for Jeremiah when he's prophesying is, you know, he's never married. He's always brokenhearted. You might have heard in some of the commentaries, uh, Jeremiah is nicknamed the weeping prophet because he's just always feeling like, oh my gosh, my, the people I'm speaking to, I, I can't believe I'm going to live through seeing Jerusalem destroyed. And he's just weeping and crying for them. And, the, and, the, and many tears are shed for the city and for his people. So God sends Ezekiel. He's going to send him in the spirit, it seems, back over to Israel to prophesy. God's going to take him also out to the Kibar, there that canal in Tel Aviv in Babylon, and actually say, while you're there, I want you to be a watchman. It's kind of an awkward statement to think you're not in Jerusalem, but I want you to be a watchman on the tower wall of Jerusalem. And it's as if he's saying symbolically, this is your opportunity to speak forth the word of God as a watchman on God's behalf. And in verse 22, we saw that the God's spirit fills him, but his hands are bound and he can only speak when the Lord allows him to speak. And so the Lord's setting him up now in front of all the people to demonstrate to them, you're going to go into captivity and Ezekiel's going to show you through my word what the plan is. Now, I mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 4, you can read about this in verses 1 through 8, to build a model of the siege that's coming. And he's down there in the dirt building this thing. Imagine a nice crowd standing around him and go, hey, what's going on right here? He goes, ah, there's some like 26, 25, 27-year-old guy. He's like building a sandcastle. And he's got all these soldiers and he's got this wall and he's putting sand up against it like a siege ramp. And uh, then after that, every day in the afternoon for an hour or so, uh, he laid on his left side for 390 days in a row and then laid on his right side for 40 days. And that, we've covered that in detail several weeks ago about the 430 years of judgment for Israel and 70 of those would be captured in the siege and the exile to Babylon. Then as you get into Ezekiel chapter 5, really interesting imagery. Um, in fact, let me read a little bit to you. You can turn over your Bibles to Ezekiel 5. Um, he's going to have him take scissors or a, a shearing knife and cut off his hair. And he's going to bring out a scale and he wants them to weigh out one third of your hair in one pile, another third in another pile, another third in the other one. And the three piles are going to be used to represent that people are going to be judged first by plague, one third are going to be judged by famine, and the other one third are going to die by the sword. And he says, um, look at verse 1 of Ezekiel 5. As for you, son of man, take a sharp sword. Use it like a barber's razor on your head and on your beard. And take the scales out for weighing and dividing the hair. A third shall burn in the fire of the city in the center. When the days of siege are completed, then you shall take a third and strike it with the sword all around the city. And a third you'll scatter to the wind and unsheath a sword behind them. Take those few hairs and number from them. And this is what I always love. In all three cases, he's told to just take a little pinch of hair from each one and wrap it up in the corner of your garment because it's going to be the faithful remnant that will still survive and come through the judgment to one day ultimately be still his people again. And as he says, take some and um, throw some in the fire and burn them in the fire as well and spread them on the house, but bind the other ones in the hem of your robe and that's your, that's your faithful remnant. This is what the Lord God says, I've placed her at the center of the nations and all the lands around her will look and watch. And uh, so I said there's the plague, of, uh, and then there's the famine, there's the sword. And in verse 15 it says, um, all the world that surrounds Israel, scroll down to, um, to verse 15, so it will be a disgrace an object of abuse, a warning, and an object of horror to all the nations that surround you when I execute my judgment against you in my righteous anger and my wrath. I, the Lord, have spoken, 
And what he's saying is the, the world's going to watch as I judge, and they're going to say, wow, their God is the real deal. He's really God. And then in verses in chapter 6 and 7, he's going to begin prophesying judgment, very specific judgment on God's people. And then we come to chapter 8. God's going to transport him. Uh, flip over to chapter 8 of Ezekiel. And looking in verse 3. And he extended the form of a hand and took me by the hair of my head, and the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the entrance of the north gate of the inner courtyard, where the seat of the idol of jealousy. Underline that in your notes or see it up here. I've got it in uh, the image of jealousy. This is that statue that's there in the temple. And the big question is, was he just having a vision? Or was he actually transported? And everybody debates this, the scholars and all the, the biblical writers and the theologians. Uh, a couple of things to consider. Remember in Acts chapter 8, verse 40, Philip is literally what? Picked up by the Holy Spirit and transported, not, in, not, not figuratively or just in the spirit. He's transported to go down to Ashdod so that he can, which is Gaza today, and he goes there so he can meet the Ethiopian. And yet Paul makes a statement that I was transported. I know a man, he's talking about himself, 2 Corinthians 12, who went up to the third heaven and saw things that were not even allowed to be expressed. And so you have kind of this interesting thing. Was it a spiritual thing that he did? Was it like John was you know, on Patmos? Was he just having a vision or was he literally transported? It says he was taken into the day of the Lord. Interesting. And then look at verse 5 of uh, Ezekiel 8. And it says, um, Then he said to me, Son of man, raise your eyes toward the north. So I raised my eyes toward the north, and behold, the north of the altar gate was this idol of jealousy right at the entrance. And um, this is the Babylonian goddess Astarte. And um, she's, uh, she's pretty bad. Um, you see about her in 2 Kings chapter 21, 2 Chronicles 33. Manasseh, King Manasseh is the one who brought this idol into the temple because he was fully immersed in all the imagery of Canaan. And so here's a couple of archaeological finds of this, uh, this goddess. She's uh, all about fertility, and she's all about um, just pagan lust, and uh, just the idea of uh, uh, just having multiple, multiple lovers and you can see how uh, she's depicted in many of the artworks that are uh, uncovered. And um, she's got feet like a bird, and she's got wings like a bird, and yet she's all about uh, just boasting in herself that she can raise herself up above anything. And look at verses 6 through 12. Again, we're still in Ezekiel chapter 8. And uh, he said to me, Son of God, do you see what they're doing? The great abominations with the house of Israel are committing here? that I would be far from my sanctuary? Hear what he's saying? He's saying, they're doing stuff in the sanctuary that's abominations, terrible things inside. The priests are in there, and he says, do they literally think that I don't see? Do they think that I, like, take a break in the evening, and when the sun goes down, they can do stuff, and I won't see it? And see, what happens is these secret chambers, there was pagan worship going on by the priests, now, you might have remembered if you heard me talk about um, the Christmas story and how Zacharias was in the temple and we're told that he was of the uh, course of Abijah. You go back to Second Chronicles, you can read about the 24 courses of priests that took turns rotating every 28 days on a lunar calendar to do their service in the temple. And every 28 months, or excuse me, 24 months, you'd come back in again after 24 months and you'd have your cycle start again. And he was of the course of Abijah, which is the eighth course. And um, what's happening is you've got these priests who are doing their service in the temple. We'll see in a moment. I'll put a map up, an overview of what the temple looked like. There's these little chambers all around the perimeter of the, of the temple, and they're little apartments, and it's where the priests were able to stay while they were doing their service. It wasn't like there was a Best Western or a Holiday Inn a couple blocks away. You stay in there while you're working at the temple, and you go back each night. There was actually a room you could stay in, and each one had their own. And... In this vision, verses 7 and 8, he's, he's taken back and he sees the walls of the temple. 
And, he, and, the, and the Lord says to him, start, start going like this and chipping away at the, at the soft wall. And he starts doing that, and he pokes a hole through the chamber of the outer wall into one of these little apartments where the priests live when they stay at the temple during their time to serve. How are we doing? Everybody with me? Okay. And he looks inside the hole, and you know what he sees? A little table set up with some incense burning, and he's got some idols going, and there's some uh, animals on the, on the wall, and, and it's all this pagan worship. He digs in through the wall, he sees the priest's inner chambers. There's statues, there's creeping things, there's beasts on the wall. When you read it, I'm immediately taken to Romans chapter 1. Remember our Romans study? Can you believe that was like four years ago we did that? But in Romans, we looked at the, in chapter 1, the whole idea of the general revelation of all we see around them, and yet Paul summarizes it by saying, but they end up saying in their hearts there is no God, so they end up worshiping the creation, the creation rather than the creator. Remember that? And that's what he looks through that, that little hole in the wall, and he sees this, this little apartment where the bed and the table and things are set up, and it's all decked out with idol worship. Now, can you imagine? <laughs> in your little private chamber, in your little private priest apartment, you're, you're doing all this pagan worship, and then you come out to make sure you're on time to do what? Oh, the altar of incense, or it's my turn to do the sacrifices at the brazen altar, or it's my turn to light the seven gold lampstand, or I'm supposed to be, you know. And, and he says, ah, that's what you guys are doing? Really? And by the time you get to verse 11, this guy, Jazaniah, who's the son of Shaphan, uh, Shaphan is the one who implemented the revival of Josiah when Hilkiah found the, 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 the word of the Lord in the temple. But Jazaniah is going to do what? He's going to do the exact opposite of his father. He's going to take everybody back to the pagan, heathen worship they were in before. And you can read about it. Jeremiah speaks about it in chapter 26, 29, 36, and also in verse in chapter 39. And what you end up seeing is kind of a, a revival countered by let's fall right back into the old ways. And then a prophet comes and speaks to them, speaks judgment upon them. They tend to maybe you know, repent and everything, and then right on the heels of that, they're what, right back to the same old things again. So here's the temple, and you can see how you come in through the main area. Here is the bronze altar, which is where the sacrifices were done, and there's the bronze sea. We'll take a look at that in a moment on the, on the image. And you come up here onto the court, and there's these two pillars. One's called Jochen, like I mentioned, Diana Jochen. Not the same spelling, but close. And the other pillar is Boaz, and they have really big significance. And you come in, and here's the holy place, and then there's the veil and the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies. But all around, on the sides, you can see marked 1 through 30 are these little apartments. They're probably about 6 foot by 8 foot, and that's where the priests would stay. And so I put some arrows on there so you can see how those circle around that. Can you imagine right around the holy place and the Holy of Holies, if you had the key and you were the, the resident assistant, you know, the RA among the, uh, the priests, you'd open up the door and go into somebody's room, and you'd see little candles lit, and there's like a, a fox skin hanging over here, and birds over here, and there's little idols set up, and there's incense burning, and these are the guys who are serving the Lord in the holy place at the altar of incense, and going into the Holy of Holies once a year on the, year of, on the Day of Atonement. I mean, what do you think God's feeling is about this? Oh, let it slide, you know, they're just human, you know. No, he is in, his anger is enraged. Here's another great artist rendering with a cutaway version. And here's the glassy sea right here. I'll show you a picture of it even bigger in a moment with all the different uh, bowls underneath it, the 12 uh, uh, in total. And you can see the smaller basins on the side. And then these are those little apartments all along here where they would stay. And it's just on the other side of the wall from going right into the uh, altar of incense, you can see the priest there right in front offering up the prayers of the saints. And look at what the, what the, the glassy sea looked like, I mean, compared to the size of a person. You know, when you read about it in the, in the account in Second Chronicles about how it's supposed to be built, this thing is massive. I mean, that's the, three times the height of an individual. <clears throat> and um, you can see it right here, you know, filled with water. And we tend to think of even as the brazen altar is kind of like a charm glow with a couple of you know, automatic burners or something and a lid that lifts up and they do like one little tri-tip at a time or something. Okay, this thing could take, that altar could take a full bowl, several full bowls at a time. And many, many lambs at the same time. That's why the sweet smell around the temple was the aroma. 
Um, Kim and I, just a couple of days ago, uh, I made a tri-tip. There was nobody coming over or anything. We, just, we usually do it for a big family get-together, but I said, we should just do one for us. And I've got, at Christmas, I got a, a card from a couple of my kids for Amazon, and I went ahead and finally bought myself a commercial-grade deli slicer with the rotary blade. And now I can actually take my tri-tip and I can slice it so you can hold it. It's like paper thin. It's just piles of it and uh, pour all the juices back on it. And she made fresh focaccia bread and a um, little avocado, grilled onions, a little mayo on this grilled focaccia with this thinly sliced mound of, oh my gosh, it was the best tri-tip sandwich I've had in a long time. And when that thing was cooking on the barbecue, my neighbor on the other side is like, hey neighbor, I hear this voice on the other side of the fence, you know. And there's people outside. Have you ever pulled into the parking lot in, in somewhere where there's an in and out? And they probably have the fans blowing out, you know, to draw you in, okay? It's a great smell. And that was the smell around the temple as well as the sacrifices. And as you continue in chapter 8, look at verse 12 in chapter 8 of, of uh, Ezekiel. Go down to verse 12. Then he said to me, Do you see, son of man, what the elders in the house of Israel are doing in the dark? each man in the rooms of his carved images? For they say to themselves, quote, Oh, the Lord doesn't see us because the Lord has abandoned the land, unquote. So they're literally saying, can you imagine that? You're serving the Lord in the temple and your mentality is, well, the Lord's already abandoned us. My first thought would be, so what are you doing at the temple serving? And on top of it, they're going, he doesn't even see what we do in the little, in the little rooms. And that got me thinking. Ephesians chapter 5 it says, awake sleeper, arise from the dead. You've heard that before. It says, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them, for it's, it's an abomination to even speak of the things which are done by them in secret. And, and so Paul's writing about that to the church in Ephesus, the unfruitful deeds of darkness, having that mentality that, you know, God doesn't see. God, God doesn't know. He's not around. He doesn't check me out when I'm doing this. This is my own little thing I do. I had to tell you when I was... I told you I was speaking last, this past week at a big tech conference in Las Vegas. I worked the board on a strategy session on Tuesday, had Wednesday off, and then Thursday I was the keynote speaker at their closing luncheon on kind of the global uh, economy and the future expectations for technology spending around the globe and some of the newest technologies. And um, boy, every time you have to go anywhere in the Wynn Hotel, what do you have to walk through? The casino. To go to breakfast, you gotta walk through the casino. To go to the Boardroom, you got to go through the casino to go to the meeting room where the, where the closing luncheon was going to be. You have to go through the casino. And you come down at quarter of seven in the morning just to go get a coffee and a croissant. And there's people sitting at these tables with a couple of beers and a stack of chips. And I'm thinking, have you been up all night? Did you get up at 6.30? Come and that place never stops. And it really hits you how uh, some people that make that comment, you know, you've heard it, the, uh, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. The idea being if you go there, you're, you have a free pass, and then you can just leave it as you head back down the 15 and head towards Southern California again. But remember, the Lord sees. And then look at verses 13 and 14. This is really unnerving. And he said to me, yet you're going to still, still see an even greater abomination which they commit. And he brought me to the entrance of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, I saw women sitting there weeping for Tammuz. Oh my gosh. Tammuz is a Phoenician slash Babylonian goddess. There she is. And Tammuz is the son of Babel, who's the, who's, Babel's queen is uh, Semiramis. She's married to Nimrod. The Greeks called her Adonis, the husband of Ishtar. Apparently what happens to Tammuz is he dies at the winter solstice each year when it's really dark, the darkest day of the year, 24th, 25th, 26th of December. Then he's raised back to life, and while he's dead, the whole city will light fires to guide and usher him back from the underworld on that darkest day of the year. And they'll end up saying now that he's back, he's represented by an evergreen tree that now has new life, and we're going to do what to the evergreen tree? We're going to decorate it with all kinds of gold and beads and all kinds of decorations, because prior to that, the way we're going to get rid of the old way we used to be for Tammuz is we're going to burn, symbolically, a log to say that this is his old life that's passed, and the Babylonian term for a Yule, uh, for a youth, per, a, little, a little young man, is a Yule, 
And so the Yule log is burned as a way to represent Tammuz coming back from the underworld. So we then represent him with an evergreen tree covered with all kinds of decorations. So I know I just pulled the rug right from underneath your Christmas, okay? But think about it. Think where these traditions come from. Um, you know, I had a lot of fun decorating the tree at our house with some grandkids. But you read this, and it's like, no tree this year, kids. Okay, we're going to do something different, okay? And in Canaan, he was called Baal. And in Egypt, he was called Osiris. And in Sumer, he was called Demuzi. And it's some more from chapter 8. Ezekiel sees even greater abominations. Look at verses 15 and 16. I mean, it just, first we're in the, inner, the, the little private apartments, and they've they're, they got incense lit, and they're worshiping animals and having prayers to all these things. Then he looks and he sees all these women wailing and doing the whole plan for Tammuz, and oh, he's coming through the underworld, and we're trying to guide him back through. And look at the last one, verses 15 and 16. Do you see this, son of man? There are still even greater abominations that's going on. This is in the Lord's house, the model of his heavenly realm. Think about this. He brought me into the inner court, yard of the Lord's house, and behold, at the entrance of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, you saw that just a moment ago, there were 25 men with their backs to the temple of the Lord while their faces faced toward the east, and they were prostrating themselves toward the sun. Think about that. There are 24 courses of priests who serve in the temple and one chief priest and representative of those 24 courses, the eighth course was Abijah, that was Zacharias's course, 24 courses plus one chief priest, 24 and one, you can all do that, right, in your head, 25, okay? He comes in and he sees they have their back to the temple and they're all facing east because the sun is rising in the east and they all prostrate themselves as they worship the sun. They're in the inner court of the temple. Symbolically, all 24 courses of the priests represented by these 24 individuals and the chief priest, the 25 of them are worshiping the sun. The women are weeping and wailing for Tammuz, who's been killed at the winter solstice. Inside the, chiefs, inside the, the priest's little apartments, they have all kinds of idols and little statuettes, and they have animals on the wall, and their, their incense is burning in candles. And finally, verse 17, you can look at your Bibles. They fill the land with violence and provoke Yahweh to his anger. I, I would guess so. I don't think Yahweh looks down and just goes, oh, those, those people are just so silly. You know, yeah, I just got to, kids are kids. You know, you got to let them be. Like, yeah. No, he's, they're doing it in his temple. And then, I love the term. Look in verse 17. I don't know what your, what, how your Bible translates it, if you have a good translation or not. But uh, he says that, um, is this the trivial thing for the house of Judah to commit these abominations? Of course not. They have filled the land with violence. Yet behold, they are putting the twig to their nose. And the twig to the nose is the idea of where we get our modern day colloquialism, thumbing your nose at somebody. And the idea, when you thumb your nose, that's a statement of what? Disrespect. I don't recognize your authority. And they're putting the twig to the nose toward the Lord. Just let that sink in for a moment. This is, and the Lord's watching all this. And what's their mentality? The Lord doesn't even see it because he's already departed from this place anyway. What are you guys doing? Playing temple? Right? I mean, what's going on there? They're thumbing their nose, disrespect for authority. And the Lord says in verse 18, look at verse 18, I have no pity for them at all. Think about that. We'll wrap up with this. Look at uh, chapter 9, verse 3. Now it's going to become real. So all this has gone on. Ezekiel has seen all this. And oh my gosh, he must just be, I can't, I, Lord, why did you show me all this? Remember, he's in Kibar, there in Tel Aviv, on the uh, banks of the Kibar Channel in Babylon. The Lord's transported him to go back and see what's going on in the temple. Whether he was there in physical, like, uh, like Philip was transported to see the Ethiopian eunuch, or whether it's like Paul, Saul of Tarsus, who was taken up to the third heaven, and yet his body was just sitting in that back room. We don't want to debate that. But listen to what he says now in verse 3 of chapter 9. And so then the glory of the Lord of Israel ascended up from the cherub, or the cherub, 
Remember, cherub is their English pronunciation, but it's, it's pronounced cherub. And the cherub that had been between the, the throne and the altar to the threshold of the temple. So the presence of the Lord is symbolized during the day by this smoke. And at nighttime, it's a pillar of fire. During the day, a smoke. And the Lord said, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and make a mark on the foreheads of the people who groan and sigh over the abominations which are being committed. Well, here's the first piece of good news. In the city, there actually are some people who are what? Disgusted with this. And they're just going, I cannot believe what the priests do. I cannot believe what the women are worshiping Tammuz. My neighbor has got a Christmas tree, and, uh, you know, they got Frosty and Rudolph out in front of their house and everything. And uh, no, I'm just teasing, but... He, there, he says, there are some who what? Are faithful remnants. God's presence is going to be departing. We're literally going to watch in a moment. The presence is going to leave the temple. It's going to go out. Spoiler alert here. We're going to read in a sec. It's going to go out over the east gate. And then above the Kidron Valley is the next thing over there is the Mount of Olives. It's going to sit and hover on the Mount of Olives for a little while as if to say, if you wanted to know, is, this, is the presence of the Lord leaving the temple? All the city would watch it leave, and even if you weren't there to watch it, you could call your friends and go, take a look at what's going on, and the, you see the, the presence departing over the east gate, above the Kidron Valley, and up to the top of the Mount of Olives, and then it hovers there for a little while, enough time for probably the whole city to come out and just go, is that, is that the temple presence of the Lord that was inside the temple? And then you know what it's going to do? It's going to depart for good. And so what ends up happening is in verse 4, God is going to do what? We saw that he's going to go through the city, and he's going to go ahead and he's going to mark those who are faithful. And the term faithful remnant, they're not going to perish in the siege or the destruction. He says we're going to put a quote-unquote in Hebrew, a mark on their forehead to set them apart so that when the judgment comes, they will be what? Preserved from the judgment, because they were the ones who said, I'm disgusted, like the Lord is, with the, with the actions of the priests and all these people. Here's what's really cool. Uh, Dr. Killian, the uh, uh, really great Hebrew scholar that I had a chance to take a couple classes with, I did not take Hebrew with him. He was a linguist. I ended up taking uh, New Testament Greek for two semesters with him, but he also was a Greek, uh, Hebrew scholar. And he said there was the ancient Paleo-Hebrew that predated the exile and the Babylonian version of Hebrew. And in the ancient paleo, the term mark upon the forehead was the word tav. And tav is the last letter in the Hebrew alphabet. But look at this. This is what a tav looked like up top in the modern Hebrew. But look at what it looked like in the old ancient paleo Hebrew, the tav at the time of Ezekiel. I just get goosebumps, because Dr. Killian would say, can you imagine the Lord saying to Ezekiel, I'm going to go through the city, find the few faithful remnant who are there, and I'm going to mark them with a tav on their forehead. Looks like a lot like a cross to me, doesn't it? I just think that is really, really insightful. How cool is this? God sealing his people with a cross on their forehead. Remember, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, Peter's very quick to say this. The time for judgment is coming, and it's going to start where? With the household of God. And yet, Paul, Peter said this. If it begins with them, what about those who have no regard for God? Do you get the imagery there? The household of God is Israel, his chosen people. And if judgment's going to start with them, and they're going to have pretty severe judgment, he makes this statement, so what about then the pagans who have virtually no regard for God? He's, as if he's trying to say, how bad is it going to be when the tribulation comes? Jeremiah 7 verse 4 says, don't trust deceptive words that say things like, oh, we don't have to worry because we have the temple. That's the way they used to think. You know, oh, no one's going to touch us. In fact, no, no, no outside force can come and, and do anything to us because we have the temple. We, can always, we always have the temple. And what he's getting at is saying is if God could not execute his judgment, it would actually include the temple as well. In fact, the temple was so defiled, the Lord was like, I don't even care if the temple gets destroyed. 
It's, as if, it's, a, it's not as if he was up in heaven going, oh, don't destroy the temple. You know, I gave that plans to David and he gave them to Solomon. And oh my, No, he's saying, you guys wanted, you know, I gave you the temple as a way to have an image of my throne room. But you've defiled it. And if it has to come down as part of the judgment, so be it. And yet, Jeremiah makes a statement of, they have the mentality that says, oh, God would never, you know, he would never judge because we have the temple and that's sacred. Sometimes I look at uh, this, this facility. I was on the board from 1992 to 1997. Well, that seems like a long time ago uh, here at Calvary. And we, our church was up off of Turnpike on this little uh, street called Pebble Hill. And it sat about 250 people. And it was time to grow because we were in our third service, starting to think about a fourth service. We said, no, we can't. What do we have, nine services on Sunday? So uh, we had to look for a new place. And I was on the board at the time. There were five of us, four of, four of us plus Ricky Ryan. And we had checked everything all over the place. We came down to this building, and it had been an old lemon packing plant, and most recently it had been a bus depot. And so buses would come in this door right here, oil spots all over the ground, and there would just be mechanics working them on all day. And it was 46,000 square feet, really good price. Of course, it was right next door to El Estero, which if you know, that's the name of the water treatment plant, the sewage plant right next door and so forth. And, um, and this place, once it got built out, phase one and phase two and everything, people started to attach a lot of importance to, oh, the sanctuary of Calvary Chapel. You know, we've even got, if you look up on the top above the back wall over there above the black, you can see where the drywall guy has actually carved out a Calvary Chapel descending dove. You can see it 3D up there on the, on the top there. If you go over there and take a look, there was big debate in the church about should we have the Calvary Chapel Dove, like Calvary had at Costa Mesa with Pastor Chuck. Should we have one right above the sanctuary? And big debate about that. And so we said, well, we'll put one up in there. Has anybody ever seen the, the Dove up there before? Okay. So um, interesting background if you've lived through this building. And yet people patch, attach such uh, sentiment to this place and almost becomes like a, an idol in some ways. And uh, I mean, if this place collapsed in an earthquake tomorrow, what happens to the Calvary Chapel? We just keep worshiping somewhere else. We just meet at a park, or we, the Lord would open up a new place. We're not this building. And what does Paul say? He says, man doesn't live. When he's, when he's down in, um, in Athens, and he's been invited at the marketplace by the Epicureans and the Stoics, hey, why don't you come up to the Areopagus? Remember, Ares is Mars, Pegasus is a rock outcropping of a hill. Just below the Acropolis is this Areopagus, this rock, Mars Hill, Come up there, and we like to meet and talk, and we think you're a guy that has some pretty new ideas we'd like to hear from. And when he gets up there in Acts chapter 17, his message is, I saw all the temples and all the statues around your city. You've got, a, you've got one for every god you can think of. But I saw this one altar to the unknown god, and he starts telling him about who the unknown god is. And he says this about him, what? He doesn't dwell in a house made with human hands. And they're all freaked out by that. And that always reminds me that God is not present. Remember, we're not the Old Testament where there's like smoke inside the main sanctuary at Calvary Chapel, Santa Barbara, and that the, the smoke exits after the second service, comes back in around 8 o'clock on Sunday mornings or something. No, where's the presence of the Lord now? You have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you full time. That's why any form of worship or any kind of bad doctrine that's talking about you've got to sit and you got to wait, and you got to wait for what? The presence. We're waiting for the presence. We're, that, 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 that's a throwback to really bad doctrine. We're, we don't wait for the presence any longer. The, tail, the, the veil's been torn in two, and we have direct access to God through Jesus Christ, who became sin for us, and he sees us now as righteous, and he gave us a down payment of his Holy Spirit so that he's with us at all times. In fact, as they make the statement, well, the Lord doesn't see what we do in our little apartments because, you know, the, no, the Spirit's with you when? All the time. I literally, all joking aside, I have sat over the years as an elder here at the church with men who are really into pornography or gambling or going to a quote-unquote gentleman's club or whatever, and we had to convince them, do you understand when you're doing those things, if you really are a believer, the Holy Spirit's present there, which makes me wonder if you're really a believer because you don't have any, it doesn't even, doesn't even bother your conscience to do that. And look what he says in verse 9 and 10. The iniquity of Judah and Israel is very great. The land is full of perversion. 
God's going to have no pity on them and will not spare any judgment on them. And we'll close with this. So chapter 10, look, look at it in your Bibles, verses 1 and 2. He looked up and he saw this expanse in the temple up above the Karub, above the cherub. And the Karub goes and starts scattering coals all across the city, hot coals, and they begin to do what? They begin to start burning sections of the city. And the Karub on the side of the temple, the cloud now that was filling the inner court, God's presence starts to move. And Ezekiel's watching it. And remember, Try not to get, you know, some artist rendering. You know, Ezekiel's not 95 years old with a white beard down to his, his, he's about 26, 25 years old. He's a young guy. He's watching this thing. And in verses 5 through 17, the Karub and the Galgalim, the wheels within the wheels, we covered this in our four weeks of looking at heaven, he even saw what appeared to be underneath the Karub, a human hand underneath their kanof. Remember we covered this before? It's, it's translated as a wing but it could also mean like opening up a cape or opening up your whole cloth of your, of your tunic or something. They call it a wing. But remember, they don't have feathers and they're not, they're not birds. Cape, a cloak, whatever. In verses 18 and 19, look at chapter 10, 18 and 19. The glory now leaves, the, leaves with the cherubim. The it goes off the top of the mercy seat over the ark and heads out toward the east gate. And God's glory hovers to the east across the Kidron to the Mount of Olives. And it does not return. To this, the first temple, there's no record of it ever coming back to the second temple. Nothing about it in Herod's temple. In fact, the next time you see anything about the presence or the glory of the Lord is when Jesus is up on the Mount of Transfiguration. And in Matthew chapter 12, verse 6, Jesus makes the statement that I am greater than this temple. Because remember, what the Jews of the first century put all of their adoration, everything, to, have you seen our temple? Have you seen the temple? What does Jesus say about it? I tell you that um, this temple will be taken down and not one stone will be left upon another. And yet I will rebuild it in three days. And what did they do? They laughed, mocked on him and said, it took hundreds of years to build this thing. You're telling me you're going to rebuild it in three days? What's he talking about? His body. And that's why Saul can say up on the Areopagus, he can say, God doesn't dwell in a house made with human hands. This is where the statement comes down to, even though the Jews felt like they were incredibly special because of their temple, there's even mention of it by Paul when he's writing to the church in Rome. He, he notes the fact that we owe a lot to the Jewish nation and God's chosen people because look at all the Lord did through them. With the adoption of sons is through him, through that nation. The glory of the covenants comes through them. The law comes through them. The temple and its service comes through them. All the promises of God come through them. The world is blessed through the Jews, he's saying. No other nation has that. And we'll close with this last slide. Ezekiel is prophesying judgment is quite the responsibility to do that. That's a heavy, heavy responsibility to go and speak judgment on behalf of the Lord. He calls out the priest's private sin, the idolatry. That wasn't easy to do, even as he saw the women weeping for Tammuz. And on top of that, he then saw just all the, all the 24 courses of the priests and the chief priests with their backs to the temple, facing the east gate, bowing down prostrate as the sun rises, worshiping Osiris the sun god. All in Jerusalem watched the glory of the Lord's presence depart, sit up on the Kidron Valley, and then disappear to never come back again. Must have been quite the dis discussions and debates and deliberations going. Imagine everybody afterwards going, was that, was that the presence of the Lord that was sitting over the Kidron? Yeah. And it's gone? Yeah. What do you think that means? <laughs> I think the Lord's departed. I think he's had enough. I think he's looked at what he's seen. See, God's glory has gone from Jerusalem for the next 500 plus years. When's the next time it's seen? Matthew 17, Mark 9, Luke 9, all, re all record Peter, James, and John going up on the hill, and there the Lord is transfigured with Elijah and Moses, glowing like it's so bright, like the, the sun, and they get a chance to see the Lord's incredible glory that's masked by his humility and his ability to take on the form of a man to die on the cross for our sins. And the next time we'll see it after that is in Ezekiel 43, 
verse 2 all the way up to chapter 44, verse 4, where you hear, God's glory is going to return in the Millennium Temple. And it's going to be incredible when we get to that in a couple weeks or maybe a couple months. So next week, we're going to be in part two of the judgment. We're going to look at Jeremiah and we'll look at Isaiah. You've had a good chance to kind of get a feel for Ezekiel's comments. Now, I've had lots of people remind me that two weeks from tonight, Network Medical here in town, which is incredible, incredible, great work for uh, unborn babies and for pregnant women and young kids and all uh, young gals who are pregnant. Um, they're having their annual fundraiser. They're going to have uh, the head of the Babylon Bee. Anybody check out the Babylon Bee? It's a great satire on uh, very funny. Uh, the head of that's going to be here. So two weeks from tonight on the 22nd, we will meet next week, the 15th. Get your taxes in by 5 o'clock with a postmark on the 15th of April. And, uh, and then you can come to the study in the evening. And then uh, two weeks from tonight, we'll take the, we'll take the night off. Because I, I know so many of us, including my wife and I, want to go and uh, support Network Medical in their fundraising. Once a year, they do this, which raises their whole budget for the whole year so they can stay open. And so that'll be at the Granada. And uh, if you want to find out about that, go to their website. But that'll be two weeks from tonight. So we'll be on next week, the 15th, off the 22nd. And then we'll be back again the 29th. And I'll, I'll get an email out to everybody, and you'll know what, what's going on with that, OK? So let me pray for us, and then we'll do some questions. Father in heaven, thank you for this time. It's a tough study, Lord, to look at uh, you using prophets to judge. And yet, so many of these things that are called out, Lord, have great comparisons to what still goes on today. Private sin, things that we think the Lord doesn't see, things that we think are ways we can kind of mesh some, some things of the world with what I do at church. Um, are we just going through the motions? Are we just doing this out of routine? Uh, Lord, remind us. Lord, we want to be like those ones who got marked with the Tav. Lord, that uh, you went through the city and you found those who were appalled at the abominations going on, your faithful remnant, and you sealed them so they would not have to go through that judgment. And so, Lord, I thank you that you always have those who stand firm. I pray that all those in this room this evening, Lord, will be those who stay in the word, stand firm, always have a wonderful answer for those who ask, and... Um, really understand and know God's word in a way that builds us up and um, just lets us be better witnesses for you and all that we say and do. So thanks for this time. We look forward to getting together next Monday. And uh, I just pray that you'd give everybody a blessing as they read through Isaiah and Jeremiah in advance of next week. So thanks for this time. And uh, we give it all to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Jeff, you can turn off the uh, recording right now. And if you have